Living a public life is hard. In politics, there are few places to disappear, few places where you're not noticed by opponents or often fans who recognize you from a favorite cable news channel. Tonight's guest had one of those faces. He was an award-winning author and professor, a psychologist who dispensed hours of life advice on TV on topics like mental health, anger, violence, parenting, and relationships. It was that trusted connection that won him a high-profile seat in the state Senate and later a bigger prize, a seat in the United States Congress. But almost overnight, our guest life became a punchline for some late-night talk shows and campaign commercials. But his story didn't end there. Today, he's living with hope and helping others, and he's our special guest on State of Independence. Don't go away. Uh, Tim Murphy had it all. He was a decorated Navy officer, psychiatrist, or psychologist, I should say, husband, father, and yes, a well-known politician. But like so many of us who are ambitious and driven, God would use his own mistakes to remove his reputation and replace it with a refocused life and mission. His new book is called The Christ Cure, 10 Biblical Ways to Heal from Trauma and PTSD. And, uh, and I know his candor and transparency, along with the advice, is helping a lot of people. The first chapter details Tim's own dark tunnel in the moments after his fall from public grace. Tim, it's such an honor to have you on the show tonight. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It's a real honor to be with you, too. Yeah. Well, to, to take us to chapter one, how do you describe the depths you experienced and, and, and who was there to love you back to life? Well, let me recall the phrase from the Bible, to have won the whole world, but to have lost your soul. And I, I mean, I had that. But of course, 25 years of public life and working many years actually in television, radio, and in the Pittsburgh market, too, <clears throat> I had a lot going for me. But what I also did is I was away from home for a couple of decades. I mean, literally away from home. I would get up early in the morning, you know, travel town to town and be away. It doesn't do much to keep a marriage going. And well, you know, years later, I drifted away in ways I should not have. And when all this came crashing through, I realized I've got to do something and get back to what is really my purpose in life. And so I could have hung in there with politics for a while, but I didn't. I said, I'm going home. Actually, my wife came to Washington, D.C., got in the car, packed up the things, and on off we went to rebuild a life. Now, let me tell you, it was not easy. I was really in the depths of despair and a depression that I have fought for years. But the way I fought that was I thought I could fight it by being more ambitious, by being more successful, by having more <clears throat> prizes, as it were, more law, laws uh, with all that. Having lived in a home uh, with an alcoholic father was pretty abusive to us. But I always thought, if only I achieved just one more thing, maybe things will be better. Well, it didn't work. And I really had to come to terms with that in a way that God, you know, I, the way I look at this is God sometimes whispers in our ear, says, you know, you need to redirect your life. And sometimes he taps us on the shoulder and God says, I really mean that. And sometimes God hits you upside the head with a two by four and said, okay, this is it. I've got plans for you <laughs> right. and you better listen now. <clears throat> so I got the two by four. Uh, but it, it was still was so dark for me that I can remember waking up in the morning. I would cry myself to sleep. I'm not ashamed to say that. It's how bad it got. Wake up in the morning cursing the sunrise and say, I, I, I wish I wasn't here. But what emerged for me from all this was that people who I didn't know came to me, surrounded me. Uh, I got myself, um, I've got like 30 different Bibles behind me, but have only read them now and then. But I thought, I'm going full bore into this thing. What I really found is studying the life of the Apostle Paul, a man whose list of traumas um, is massive. You know, uh, uh, not only having to change his whole life after the uh, epiphany on the road to Damascus, but beaten with rods, uh, whipped, um, shipwrecked in the ocean, driven out of town. Uh, all these terrible things happened to him. But what he emerged with this was he never became weaker. In fact, he said, through my weakness, I'm stronger. Uh, that he really understood, especially in Romans 12, 2, where he said, you have to be transformed by a renewing of the mind. So as I read more about him, I thought, well, there must be a book about why didn't Paul the Apostle have PTSD with all its overwhelming emotions, broken relationships, perhaps, I mean, should he have been an alcoholic, a gambler, um, whatever else, depression, nightmares? 
but he didn't. And I thought, well, why didn't he? Well, as it turns out, nobody had written a book about Paul in those lines. <clears throat> and so it was really a strange thing. I, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I would sit down on my keyboard and just start writing and out this poured this book to talk about how we can recover from our trauma. And understand, I was a psychologist who worked in the Navy and in, in my own practice, helping people with their own traumas, never really thinking I was gonna have it this bad myself. <laughs> but realizing Paul, it's a great lesson. It's a, uh, it's a great inspiration. He's a great mentor for us because God's worked through him to inspire other people to say, whatever your troubles are, there's beautiful things out there of faith, hope, and love. And I realized unless I grabbed onto those things in my whole life, not tepidly, not marginally, not kinda, but really full bore, all in, things would not work out. And now I realize for those I work with, the veterans and first responders I work with, the trauma and others, the churches I speak at and others, I, I realize that is the way. That is really the way. If you want your trauma to change, you have to change yourself physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. So so where, where did it all begin? You grew up in Pennsylvania? I grew up in Ohio, actually, uh, in a, a rural area in Ohio, um, northern Ohio, a town called Northfield. Now, I had one of 11 kids. One of we a, what, what, of what, 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 number, what number were you of the 11? Four. I'm supposed to be the well-adjusted one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Didn't quite work out. <laughs> so four of 11, um, that's a big family. Uh, did you have a farm? Did you live on a farm or...? We, we, we did not farm our land except an acre or so that we had uh, to feed the family because my parents just didn't have money. I mean, we were, by all measures, on the lower edge of the socioeconomic scale. <clears throat> you got one pair of shoes a year. Uh, you, made, you made your way through. Uh, but my mother was very um, very grounded in that, and she, she said, you don't see yourselves as having less money. In fact, one time we would get we would get these gift baskets from the local charity organizations at Christmas time, and she said, get in the car, we're going to go deliver that to the real poor family. <clears throat> we weren't allowed to keep them. Wow. So it, it, it helped us get grounded with that. But I don't say those things to, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have pity about that. I don't want anybody to see that. I want to see that there's a lot of lessons in my life that I had forgotten about. And that's what things do to us. We forget about the things in our own life timeline where we could say, well, what are the values that I've taken out of this? Do I have strength? Do I have discipline? Do I have hope? Do I have uh, forgiveness? <clears throat> do, do I have endurance? Uh, and all those things that are necessary that I saw Paul had. And it is one of those things that I like to help people rediscover in themselves and understand that all along the gifts have been there from God, but you just forgot to open them, hmm. but they're there. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's a that's a, a, a good thing. Uh, you obviously had to overcome a lot as a uh, as a young kid to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get where you are. I mean, I'm, I'm sure um, going to college was not a given for you, um, um, or even the military. The military might have been the only option, I'm, I'm guessing, with a family of 11 kids. Um, <laughs> and and y you excelled, and, and, and then you're so respected, so highly regarded, you get elected to the state senate, and then while you're there, uh, you do such a great job that you're, you, you, you win a, a house seat, a seat in the U.S. Congress. Uh, that's something that lots of people aspire to and not very many people ever attain in this life. Um, so what, what did it, what, tell us what your, your mindset was to, to get there. I mean, to, to get where you got, you know, coming from a family with 11 kids, you know, not a lot of money, uh, living in a rural area, um, certainly, you know, no example uh, to, to follow. It wasn't like, you know, your dad was a congressman, you know, and you, you might inherit his seat. You know, you, you didn't have that. What, what was it, what was it in you that, that, that gave you the drive to, to do all the stuff that you did? Well, that's a great question. See, I, I was driven by the hurt that I saw in others, but particularly in the area of healthcare. When I first ran for state Senate in the 90s in Pennsylvania, uh, I just saw there were such tremendous problems with healthcare, the way it was run by insurance companies. I began to talk to a lot of people about it. And in fact, I even would go to Harrisburg sometimes and say, this is what I recommend you do. Well, <clears throat> what happened was at the time there was this US Congressman by the name of Rick Santorum. He said, Tim, all these years you've been getting all of us advice, it's time you step up and do it. And I said, oh, what, do, what am I supposed to do? He says, well, you're running for state Senate. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knocked on a lot of doors with that message. And quite frankly, that's what led me to Congress, too. I knew there was a problems with health care. I knew the people talked about it, but did not know what to do about it. But particularly in the area of mental health. I mean, you look at the area of trauma. Seventy percent of the population at some time will have some life threatening trauma to themselves or an immediate family member. It is huge. 
about 20% of those have lingering problems from them. But there's not a lot of people really know what to do or how to heal from that. I'm sure many, many of the people watching right now are thinking, my gosh, I've had trauma in my life and I've had the scars lingering there for a long time. Well, <clears throat> through legislation, I wanted to make sure we had more accessibility to care, more providers out there that we did whatever we needed to do. And what I found was there was massive numbers of bureaucratic barriers in the federal and state systems that kept people from, from getting help. So a lot of people talk about mental health, they'll, they'll do things, say, let's support these, let's reduce, reduce suicide. But there's more to it than that. Uh, and it really involves a lot more work. I know when I passed my major mental health reform legislation that President Obama signed into law after it was amended onto another bill, <clears throat> It, it was a big breakthrough. Uh, it was it was listed as the perhaps the biggest mental health reform in the last half century. But there was so much more to do. The way I looked at it is we didn't get everything we needed, but we needed everything we got. Um, but there was a lot more. But what happened is I was just, I was really wiped out. Uh, it, you know, when people watch almost as a spectator sport, what goes on in Congress, people cheer it on when people are hurt or yell or insult each other or get destroyed or watch those things. Let me tell you, it is not a fun place to be, especially right now when I'm back in touch with some of my former colleagues. They talk about how mean it is and how what it's like to live with the media following you around. I mean, literally following you around. I would have cameras just chasing me down the hall, going to the restrooms, um, sitting in front of my house, um, <clears throat> tracking me wherever I was. It's brutal. It's very rough on the families and individuals, but you got to drive forward. And I think one of the best decisions I made, well, the best decisions God made for me was Get out of there, go home, and help other people again. So, uh, you, you, so the trauma you faced was 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 uh, was was so, so public, obviously, uh, because you were uh, an elected official. Um, were, were there were there people um, that came to your rescue that 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 said, "Hey, hey, Congressman, hey, hey, Tim, we love you." Uh, and did the people that came to, if people came to to comfort you and to to help you? Were, there, were these the people that you expected to come uh, for you, or, or did, did no one come for you? Tell, tell us about that. It's interesting. These are people I kind of marginally knew, but not really knew. And this is going to sound like a set of, uh, for a joke, but there was a Methodist pastor, uh, Assembly of God pastor, a Catholic priest, and a Jewish friend hmm. <clears throat> would reach out to me and say, it's not over. There's much more to live through. You have these gifts. And I'd meet with them, and we would read the Bible. We'd talk. We would pray. It, it really comes down to, I mean, one of the key things that it comes to dealing with trauma, and I should say in my own life, it isn't just what happened to me in Congress and the public shame. It was what happened growing up in, in a family where you just didn't hear much about good things happening. It was really a struggle. Oh, to hear my father you know, attacking my siblings, um, <clears throat> attacking my mom, to put myself between my father and my mom. I don't harbor ill will against him now, but for a long time I did. I just, that just seared on my soul and the grudges there. I had to let go of that. But that's that uh, trauma can be one big event, but it could also be the death of a thousand cuts where all these little things pile up chronically. Uh, but people did come and we talked and I found myself in a position where the more honest I was, the better I felt. There was really something to that idea that you got to talk about your things out loud. Um, it doesn't do any good for any of us to hide them because we all know what's going on. God knows what we're doing. Can you imagine if we're saying, I think I'll just hide this. And God's stepping <laughs> back and really? You yeah, think you can hide it from me? Right. <clears throat> How's that working out for you? And right. it's not. Right. We, we know we can't uh, hide. You're absolutely right from, from God. How did, how did this impact your your uh, your your journey, your faith journey. You know, you're a Christian guy, uh, you know, a follower of Jesus, and uh, you, you you face this 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 terrible trauma. How how did that impact your 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 faith life? You know, it's interesting. I'm in this men's Bible study group. We're called cigar smoking Christian men, <laughs> and <clears throat> we get together on Monday nights at a cigar shop. We read the Bible out loud there in the cigar shop. It's kind of cool. But just the other night, we were talking about the traumas in our lives. And a number of said, you know, as strange as it seems, this was the thing that brought me closer to God and my relationship with Jesus. I mean, it's a daily uh, walk now. Certainly, I never forget. I mean, every day that goes by, I remember all the problems in my, I've had in my life, but it doesn't do any good to dwell on them. What is good to say, uh, thank you, uh, Jesus. Thank you, God, for helping me through this. Uh, give me some ideas of how I can help other people, how I can use my weaknesses, my strengths, to help other people discover their own strengths in this process. So that's a pretty cool thing. You know, uh, <clears throat> I talked to a guy once who was bitten by a grizzly bear. And he says, you know, it's a very small club 
but the initiation is really awful. <laughs> and yeah. I think this is a similar way. When I yeah. work with veterans who have been through war, um, who have been through combat, who have been wounded, uh, some amazing people who over, have overcome some unthinkable things, uh, and they wish they didn't have to go through that, but the power that they have, the strength and courage that they have, learn the hard way is, is a wonderful tool. And I think that's where God sometimes has to take us. Yeah, do you think that... Uh um, your earlier challenges growing up led you to decide to uh, become a psychologist. Uh, is that what moved you to just, you wanted to better understand and be able to help people who uh, maybe had to undergo what you've gone through? Yeah, that's, uh, wow. Um, yeah, I think so. It was a matter of, uh, I've been there. I know, I know what it's like to be in hell and it's not a good place to be. And I want to help other people work their way through it. So for a long time, I specialized in helping children and adolescents uh, deal with their issues. And as I, as I moved on through life, actually, when I, I was in Congress when I joined the Navy, um, which, you know, how as do if you I do wasn't. That? How, do you, how do you join the Congress? <laughs> well, I joined the Navy Reserve. So what would happen is I usually, uh, so I wasn't just going on a drill weekend somewhere and sitting in a Navy base and uh, having a class. I worked at Bethesda Naval Hospital, which became Walter Reed. Uh, hospital at Bethesda, on a traumatic brain injury post-traumatic stress unit. It was a fantastic experience. I mean, I I got to work with real heroes, people who have been through it all, uh, and help them. And then spent some time in aircraft carriers and some training time with the Navy SEALs. They wouldn't let me do the dangerous stuff. I was an observer. But uh, it was a matter of how I could use uh, the gifts that I had at understanding trauma and help other people that continues to blossom. Yeah. You've got such an amazing background in mental health. Uh, you know, this is, a, as, you, as you rightly said earlier in the interview, that, you know, mental, the mental health challenges that we face in the society today are, like, overwhelming. Um, in, in my uh, non-TV life, uh, I work with, uh, with, uh, with mental health in that area, with the people who um, are suffering from uh, mental and behavioral challenges. Um, what do you say... I mean, you, you have the advantage of not only being a psychologist, but also having been a member of Congress. What do you say is the right approach to, to treating what has become an epidemic in this country with regards to, you know, uh, these mental health issues? Well, that's a great question. So we, it is a matter that the numbers of people with depression and anxiety have gone up so high that among adolescents and young adults, about half of them have significant symptoms of depression and anxiety. Some of that probably related to COVID, the isolation, the challenging messages, the attack, the bitterness, all those things dividing society were awful. But you know what? Our grandfathers went through so much more during the Depression and during World War II and World War I, uh, and they managed to come out okay. I think we've become a society that, quite frankly, is very soft, a society that's lost its way spiritually and, and religiously, uh, and therefore we don't know where to turn when we struggle. A lot of people turn towards drugs. They turn towards various kinds of hedonism. They do what is there as, as they seek pleasure instead of a cure. And so what happens is we didn't have enough, we don't have enough mental health providers out there. Uh, very few of them will actually openly talk about religion, even though clients, the majority say they want to talk about faith and religion in the session. But I know among psychologists, over half of psychologists say they don't even want to touch it <clears throat> because many of them just don't know what to do. Well, so we have to educate a lot of people. I think it's important that it, it is important that we do speak out about faith. We cannot be afraid of that. <clears throat> You know, it's, it's odd to me that there's all kinds of things that are politically incorrect to discuss and politically correct to discuss, uh, some of them bizarre, but uh, faith is important and healing is important. So even though there's large numbers out there of people who are struggling, uh, homelessness has grown, drug abuse has grown, drug overdose deaths have grown, um, we cannot give up. Uh, there are people who love you and care about you and want to help you, but the uh, number one person who loves you is, is God, but the number two person that has to love you is you and have that hope and the determination that whatever you've been through, um, God's forgiven you. Others might not, but God's forgiven you, and also you must. Wonderfully said. The book is The Christ Cure, a book that's helping many people through the, the dark tunnel of trauma. We'll be right back. You're watching Joe Watkins' State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. We're speaking with psychologist and former congressman Tim Murphy about 
trauma in all of its forms. Uh, Tim, we're living in a world where many of our friends live in a world of constant, nonstop news. It's, it's causing a lot of anxiety and fear, and I think many are finding it difficult to connect with the real world. Now, you've been on both sides of the camera, so, so tell me what, what, we're, what we're doing to our minds with this constant intake. Well, you know, people will slow down on highway to look at the accident. And we're, we're driven to look at some of those uh, awful things. But in today's world of 24-7, 365 news, with everybody with a cell phone, they can take pictures of everything. And stations are showing all the gruesome detail. And if you don't get it from there, you can pick it up on YouTube or other emails. It is, it is so overwhelming and it is so hideous. It is so harmful. One of my biggest worries is we get numb to it. And as we get numb to it, television stations know, gee, we have to ramp this up if we want to keep viewers. I want people to understand that the, the role of some of these news stations is to get you to watch. It isn't that to inform you, it's to get you to watch. That's right. And then they sell advertising time. And the more people that watch, the more money they make. That's their number one goal. It's not there to save you in your life. Now, we're inundated with information about Ukraine, uh, with information about the border crossing and the troubles down there, uh, terrorism in our own nation, terrorism and, and the awful things that Hamas has done in Israel. It, it is brutal and awful. What we have to be able to do is a number of things. You have to be able to turn off your TV sometimes. Just say, I, I got to take a break from the news. It's okay to be informed. It's not good to be overwhelmed. The second thing, you have to reground yourself and your family. These should be discussions you have with your family about what is important in life. And I find myself too, with my wife too, we think, oh, this is awful. Did you see what happened? But it's also really important you talk about other things that you do have control over, not just get overwhelmed by things we don't have control. And the third really important thing is make sure you take time to pray. That humility, that questioning uh, uh, of asking God for help and thanking God for the blessings we have really helps to reground us and understand the news is there, the earthly things are there, but there's a lot bigger things things that are that are going to help us and love us through this yeah that's very well said you know i i, I wanted to uh, you've kind of answered i guess but maybe you could expound a little bit more i mean uh, you know so much of you're, you're right uh, uh cable news uh is is based on on viewers i mean they need they need audience uh, in order to pay their bills so they need viewers lots of people to watch and the way you get people to watch is by of course uh you know um uh you've got to get their attention to, to get them to watch right. And, and uh, so a, a lot of what people see every day uh, causes fear. I mean, there's, you know, and that's what also gets people to move. I mean, they, they, yes. they, they vote based on fear. They, 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 people move based on fear so often. So, so how do, what do you say this to, to people? Certainly you have individual um, clients that come to you for help, but what do you say to people about uh, how to fight fear and to not be overwhelmed by fear? Because if you're watching the news as much as, as, as most people are these days, there's a lot to be afraid of. Well, I suggest, uh, I ask them to think about what they do have control over in their life. Now, some people may take this extreme and say, well, I built myself a bomb shelter. I have 90 days worth of food in my basement. I have water stored. <clears throat> and I understand those survival issues too. But that's not what it is. To say, what is it in your day-to-day -day life you do have control over? And what happens is when we're overwhelmed by fear, we oftentimes run away from the very things we should be doing. Going to those you care about. Tell them you love them. Tell your kids you're proud of them and that they're good people. Tell that to your spouse and other relatives, etc. cetera. Uh, reach out to, to friends. Reach out to strangers. Help someone who's homeless who's they're more concerned about how cold is it going to be tonight than they are worried about something over on the other side of the world. Now, I'm not saying we ignore the rest of the world. We need to be engaged with that. We need to understand about politics and elections and what it takes. But the best way to overcome fear in our lives is take control of something where we can actually have that control. It makes a big difference. Well, spoken so well, uh, uh, like a true psychologist. Well, Tim Murphy, this has been a conversation that I know has helped a lot of people think through how they respond to people who are hurting, even if they cause the pain to themselves or others. Thanks again for being on the show. You bet. I should say I have a website, drtimmurphy.com, if people want to reach me or see more of my blogs or podcasts too. Outstanding. For those watching, if you know someone who needs help getting to the other side of trauma, Tim's book is called The Christ Cure, 10 Biblical Ways to Heal from Trauma and PTSD, and it's available right now on Amazon. I'll be right back with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box.
And now let's talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. I just, I loved this conversation. I loved everything about it. I think, um, you know, for, I spent some time in, in southwestern Pennsylvania, and um, Tim is one of those people you'd always see on TV and, and had a lot to say about things. I didn't realize that he and you both have uh, connections to Rick Santorum. Yeah, that's yeah, really cool. For sure. Yeah. But you have this, uh, every public figure has a backstory, and there is no room to grow in public, right? Yeah. You can't change your mind or else you're a sellout. You can't, uh, you can't have doubts. You can't show fear. You certainly, you read about politicians uh, separating from their spouses or you hear about a salacious piece of information, but you, you know you're only seeing one little tiny piece. Right. But then you're taking that piece and the public, it, it's tossed to the public. Yeah. And the public is asked to render a verdict. And usually it's a very harsh verdict. But what Tim is doing with, with what he has gone through, and people can say, oh my goodness, it's his own making, and he admits what he admits. But then he says, now my life doesn't belong to me or the ambitions that I was chained to. I mean, he, you, if, mm -hmm. you brought out um, the, the cost of having the pursuit of ambition. And now, Tim seems to be in this sweet spot where I would send uh, just about anybody who is experiencing trauma to him and know that the advice that he would give would be pretty good advice. Yeah, no, really, uh, one, I mean, he just said so much light on uh, you know, how you deal with, with, with trauma and, of course, the fact that he had to deal with it so publicly yeah. you know, really gives what he has to say great credibility. Yeah, it's not a game. I think the other thing that came out of this interview today was when he's saying, look, politics isn't a game. You may think of it as theater, you may think of it as a video game, and you're kind of cheering the red team, cheering the blue team. But behind every politician, typically, are a lot of hurting people, a lot of people who don't want to walk out their door in the morning, who want to stay inside. And the book that he writes is, is significant because he's saying the cure for that isn't anything but reconnecting with the, the creator, the person who made you. And uh, that will be the, the, what sustains you in your dark moments. So I hope a lot of people read the book and I can't wait to have Tim back uh, on the program again. Yeah, it'd be great to have him here in, in the studio. Yeah. Yeah, 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 what a blessing. Maybe you're a public figure with a secret. Maybe you're harboring regret about the way you've treated someone in the middle of trauma. Maybe you didn't know what to say. Tim Murphy is a witness to this truth, that he who began a good work in you will continue that work until it's time to call you home. Don't live in regret. Don't live in fear. It's never too late to start loving, hurting people, or making things right with those you've hurt. For Jeff Coleman and the production team here at Lighthouse TV, I'm Joe Watkins. From America's first capital, Philadelphia, thanks so much for welcoming us into your home. God willing, I'll see you next week. family of 11 kids. 11. And from a poor family at that. Yeah. It was all the fuel I guess he needed, but it was really out of hurt comes you know, his ability to help people. It's pretty cool. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.